Happy Friday and welcome back to Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today as we look into another unsolved case. In 2020, many of us were trying to adjust to a new reality, dealing with a global pandemic. But for one family in Michigan, they also had to adjust to a new reality, one without their father. Who killed Ricky Bailey in his home? And how have they gotten away with it for almost two years at this point? We're going to go through all the publicly available information, including some comments from someone very affected by this, his daughter. But first, let's learn about where this takes place. Starting in Verona Township, Michigan. Verona Township is a civil township of Huron County. The population was over 1,300 as of the 2000 census. The city of Bad Axe is on the western boundary of the township. We're actually going to learn about both these areas. Uh, Bad Axe is much more of a city. It's got about triple the population. So if there is some element of this being, if, of the perpetrators being local, I think there's a pretty good chance that they might be from Bad Axe. Plus, Ricky really considered himself a, a Bad Axe. He went to Bad Axe High School pretty much lived in the area his whole life. Verona Township, much more rural from what I'm seeing. This is a total area of 34.2 square miles for only 1,300 people. The population density is about 39.5 people per square mile. So uh, we're talking pretty rural, kind of farmland type area. But of course, Right next to it, we have Bad Axe, Michigan. Bad Axe is a city in the U.S. state of Michigan and the county seat of Huron County. The population was 3,129 as of the 2010 census, making it the largest community in Huron County. The city's unusual name dates to the time of its settlement. When surveying the first state road through the Huron County wilderness in 1861, Rudolph Pabst and George Willis Pack made camp and there they found a much used and badly damaged axe. They decided to call it Bad Axe Camp. They put up a sign there that says Bad Axe, and when a city eventually forms, they decide that's the name of the area. This city has an area of only 2.26 square miles for almost triple the population. That population density number we talked about, about 684 people per square mile in Bad Axe. As we get into the details of what happened on a Wednesday night, somewhere around 11 p.m. on December 30th, 2020, we also hear about another very scary condition. Two of his children were home when this happened. Starting at MLive.com, police have released the name of a Huron County man shot and killed in his home by masked intruders. Bailey's 20-year-old and 11-year-old sons were at home but not physically injured. The two sons told deputies that they and their father had been in different rooms of the house when the youngest heard a door opening. He went to tell his dad when two armed assailants with handguns appeared and shot the father, deputies said. Quote, from our understanding, they yelled at the victim when he laid on the floor, making reference to wanting the money, Sheriff Kelly J. Hansen said. The victim was then further physically assaulted by one of the assailants while the youngest son attempted to lock himself in a bathroom. He was then removed from the bathroom after one of the assailants kicked the door in and escorted him to another room to tell him to lay on the floor. As this occurred, the 20-year-old son took cover in another room. The assailants eventually left, allowing the two sons to call Huron County Central Dispatch for help. Hansen added that his investigators have received numerous tips. They're being followed up on and will continue tomorrow and in the days to come, the sheriff said. Unfortunately, I have nothing more to report. The assailants were described as wearing black ski masks, black leather coats, black gloves, and black pants. It's unknown how they came to or left the scene. That's one of my questions right off the bat. Just thinking about an area kind of this rural where there's not a lot of houses. You don't have a neighborhood where you have houses facing each other on a street. Um, How was a vehicle not heard? I think I would have heard that first before a door opening, but there might be a reasonable explanation for that as well as we get through the details here. Just a quick stop. I did look through Rick Bailey's Facebook page and really what I see there is a man that seemingly has a great sense of humor, a bunch of jokes. Um, We can see this post from December 29th, 2020, literally the day before. 
It's saying I have enough money to not work for the rest of the year. Blessed. Another thing I could tell from his Facebook page, this is a man that clearly loves his family. Here's a picture of him with his daughter at a racetrack. Uh, he's a guy that's certainly into cars. We'll learn more about that. And a little bit of a heartbreaking photo here. This is his daughter's daughter, his granddaughter, in a picture that I'm sure they're going to cherish and also feel a lot of heartbreak over that this type of moment will never happen again between a grandfather and his granddaughter. Let's learn a little bit more about Ricky over at his obituary, unfortunately. Ricky H. Bailey, 59 years old, of Verona Township, passed away on December 31st, 2020. He was born in Pigeon, Michigan on December 18th, 1961. He worked for Dan's Excavating for 10 years and was self-employed working on automobiles. He raced at Owendale Speedway for many years. Rick enjoyed hunting with his children and working on cars. I understand he was also doing some truck driving. A lot of his pictures on his Facebook page are unfortunately him stuck in traffic. Um, but him trying to make light of that and having some fun with his friends while he was stuck in traffic. Rick is survived by his children, Amanda Bailey, Jason Bailey, and Ford Bailey. Those are his three kids. And then the mother of his children is Michelle Redlinsky of Port Austin. From what I understand, they were divorced, but apparently co-parented very well. Continuing at the Huron County View, from January 7th, 2021, police still looking for suspects. According to the Huron County Sheriff's Office, deputies were called to the scene around 1119 p.m. after dispatch received a call from residents of the home stating that their dad had just been shot. After clearing the scene to get to the residents of the home, deputies found an unresponsive Bailey on the floor with two gunshot wounds. Also inside were his two sons, 11 and 20 years of age, who were unarmed. I think they mean unharmed. Uh, Bailey was quickly taken by Central Huron Ambulance to the Bad Axe Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Around 3.30 a.m. on December 31st, Michigan State Police Crime Lab personnel arrived to process the scene. Unfortunately, not a lot of details about anything that they might have found. I'd be curious of, did they try to look for tracks, uh, something in the roads or in the driveway, something along those lines? Uh, what they saw inside, the forensics of the gunshots, were they both shot from the same gun? Are they shot from two different guns? A lot of questions about that that unfortunately just are not answered, that information. I mean, this is an open case, so obviously unless they think that putting that information into the public is going to help, they're probably not going to talk about that too much. Um, but we have, it seems to me from the narrative that the 11 year old had more of a chance to interact with them. And I would think from that, possibly some type of composite, of course, yeah, you're talking ski masks, but we're not even getting a sense of height, weight, anything that might've stood out in terms of difference. Yes, they're all in black. I get it. But, um, it just seems to me that there's some possible description that maybe if you did put out in the public might be a little more helpful in this case and we're, we're just not quite seeing here. It's believed that they targeted the specific residents either because of past residents or the current residents, which have not lived there long. I'm really confused by that statement. I, I, let's break it into the two parts. I mean, first of all, could it be targeted because of past residents? Did you have someone that maybe was known to carry a bunch of money possibly someone that was dealing drugs or something like that, living at that same address previously. Certainly a factor with a case like this. And from what we're hearing about this invasion, kind of would make sense. They come in, they move really fast, they hit hard, they're demanding money, and they take off. Uh, what I'm a little curious about that is, if they did think that there was money in the house, why didn't they search it? You're kind of out in the middle of nowhere police response on something like that. I mean, you've, you've just fired off a couple shots, but this is an area where, you know, people hunt. Uh, you might hear gunfire from time to time. They probably had at least minutes that they could have spent going through the house to the point of, we know that they kick in the door to the bathroom and move one of his sons, which quite honestly, I'm even struggling to understand what that's about. Like, what's the motivation? If you, if, Maybe they didn't see who ran into the bathroom. They just heard it closed and they 
wanted to go check and make sure that they didn't have a witness on their hands or something. I don't, but to kick down the door and then to see that it's an 11 year old, why are you going to move them to another room? What's the point of that? Like if he's in the bathroom, that's probably, I mean, I guess I don't know where people keep their money. If, if they're doing this type of activity, do people stash money in bathrooms? Maybe, maybe that was part of it. Move the kid out of the room. So the bathroom could be checked. I don't know. But then it's interesting that the 20 year old, uh, is, manages to hide from them the whole time. We don't really have details. I mean, you know, if he's under his bed or something like that, it's it's feasible. Maybe they do a quick sweep of the room. They don't see anything's in there and they take off. There's just, I don't know. I have a lot of questions about how this all comes together. And unfortunately, guys, we are just dealing with very little level of detail on this. So the other half is, or the current residents, which have not lived there long. Now, based on other things I'm reading, I, they might be mashing together a couple things. From what I understand, Ricky did not live there very long. And that's part of the theory about, hey, th there was someone else living there before. Maybe that's who the people were going there to see. For current residents, is there a possibility that on this piece of land, there is more than one home? Uh, I think it's possible. So here is Bad Axe. And just so you can kind of see, Ricky's home is on Rapson Road. Let's go ahead and get to that. You can see that's outside of the main city. And like I mentioned, just very, very rural area. And from what it looks like, yeah, there could be a couple of people living on this property here. Um, so is it possible that, you know, he's renting one house here, someone's renting another? Uh, certainly possible. Just want to zoom out to give you guys, I mean... The other thing about looking at this map is it tells me that any opportunity of trying to get a camera next to nothing out here, we've got nothing for businesses. We don't even have homes that are really facing each other. So even if you would have a home that would have like a doorbell camera or something like that out here, it's not facing the right way to really catch what's going on. Uh, very, very tough. An autopsy was scheduled with the Huron County Medical Examiner's Office and the investigation is ongoing. I don't even really see results come out from the autopsy, but based on what's known, uh, it, it seems like he su succumbed to the gunshot wounds. So let's go ahead and continue at michigansthumb.com. The Huron County Sheriff's Office is offering a $2,500 cash reward for anyone who is able to provide information leading to the arrest of the people involved. In later articles, I can see that that has actually been increased. I believe currently it sits at $4,100. Of course, if you have any information on this case that can help solve it, please call it in. We have all the contact details that you need in the description box below. Quote, from our understanding, they yelled at the victim while he laid on the floor, making reference to wanting the money, Sheriff Kelly Hansen previously said. The victim was then further physically assaulted. I know I already told you guys that. Why am I bringing it back up? Because of this next statement. According to Hansen, it's still unclear why the assailants shot and killed Bailey. Seeing that statement kind of sent my brain into a whole different area. It is unclear. It's kind of strange that if, if you are doing a home invasion like this and you're trying to find the money, whatever your belief in that is, is the first thing that you're going to do, bust in the door, fire off two shots, and then when the guy's on the ground, where's the money, where's the money, and then further attack him after that? I don't know. I don't know that that's the best way to do this. So we're, we're either talking about someone that's very inexperienced in this, or we don't have the motive quite right. And, you know, I, I don't know who heard the quote about the money. I don't know if the 20 year old is saying that he heard that were from his hiding position or if the 11 year old heard it from his hiding position. Maybe, maybe that quote was misheard. It's pretty interesting to me that we have the sheriff here saying, we don't know why they shot and killed Bailey. It kind of makes sense like this, you know, on the outset, when you have someone yelling, Hey, where's the money? Yeah, sure. We think it's a robbery. But most robberies don't have the intent to actually kill the person. Uh, that's something that kind of happens typically. That's why we call them robbery gone wrong situations. People show up, they want something, they pull the guns to make the threat, but then they force the person to do what they want. And hopefully in many of those cases, they leave and the person is not harmed. 
doesn't always go that way. Sometimes a person will reach for the gun or there'll be some type of struggle and then things will escalate and it'll go from there. But someone showing up at this house with the intent of taking the money out of it, going in and firing off two shots right off the bat, I don't know. Or was that a response? Did they come in and say, hey, we want the money? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. But even then, are you going to fire the two shots right away? Like the order of events seems kind of backwards in my mind. Continuing at another article over at MLive, quote from the sheriff, since the crime, our office has worked countless hours attempting to find out who was responsible and why. Huron County Sheriff's investigators have been assisted by personnel from nine other law enforcement agencies, the sheriff said. I'm really glad that they're getting help on this. Uh, we're going to see in some other information, they don't deal with homicides a whole lot. So reaching out to other law enforcement agencies in the area, probably a very good move. Just try to get more resources on this. Many people have also been interviewed for possible information or clues, along with numerous search warrants being served, seeking technical and video information. So they are looking for video. He continues sorting out what we can do with all of this will continue to take more time and effort as the days and weeks, and unfortunately now months and years go on. Continuing at freep.com, daughter of slain bad ax man still questions and grieves over his death. When 22 year old Amanda Bailey got off FaceTime with her father on December 30th, same day, she never expected it to be their last phone call ever. Around 11.30 p.m. that night, the ringing of Bailey's phone pierced the air. When she answered, her mother told her something that changed her life completely. Her father had been shot. And here's a picture of Amanda. Amanda Bailey was home on the couch with her daughter when she got the news. She and her fiancé quickly got into the car and drove to the McLaren Thumb Regional Hospital, where medics transported her father. Amanda Bailey lives in Birch Run. The drive to her father's town of Bad Axe is about an hour and a half. I just had a feeling that I was going to lose him. Nobody knew at the time if he was alive or if he wasn't, she said. So driving from Birch Run all the way to Bad Axe with this on my mind as to, oh my gosh, am I going to lose my dad? Unfortunately, we know that she does. In a news release, police said it could have been a situation of mistaken identity. What does Amanda think about that? she doesn't really believe it. If it was a mistaken identity, I really feel like I wouldn't have my brothers here. I think she's likely thinking about it the same way that I was, that if this is a situation where you had, you know, the previous people renting the place were drug dealers or something like that, were known to have something that someone would want. Uh, these guys come in, they're told by someone, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. They shoot them. They beat them up further. Uh, at that point, wouldn't they go looking through the rest of the house? It really does have me questioning that aspect of, was money part of this at all? Was it even said? Uh, and there's a possibility still in my mind that it, that it could have been. It could have been. According to Ricky Bailey's record, he did have a few occurrences with the police. So the most recent incident happened in 2013, and the county prosecutor's office charged him with operating while impaired. According to Michigan State Police records, he received the same charge in 87 when he was 25 years old and 91 when he was 29. So obviously they're looking into the aspect of does Ricky have any criminal record that would make it look like he was the real target, that there was some reason for them to be coming after him. This type of record that I'm seeing here, no, not at all. Uh, it does say that he did have a weapons of offense in 1983 when he was 21 years old. But I mean, look, guys, the most recent of, of these charges is almost 10 years old. Most of them are decades old at this point. And we're talking about someone in their 20s. Despite Bailey's past legal incidents that occurred nearly a decade ago or longer, Amanda Bailey said her father was a good man and wasn't involved with drugs or activities like that. He was a truck driver and Amanda said he was always working. My dad wasn't a bad guy. My dad was not anywhere near somebody that this should have happened to. It shouldn't have happened to anybody. Bad acts isn't exempt from crime, and it has its fair share of crazy things that happen, according to Sheriff Kelly Hansen. Homicides are nothing that occurs on a common basis by any stretch. Last year, we're going to end up with two homicides. 
It's not a common occurrence by any means, you know, according to what their population is and the stats, even them having two homicides in one year is probably very high. I have a feeling an area like this would go for probably four or five years where you might not have any, and then you kind of have one or two pop up here or there, maybe once or twice in a decade. Here at Statista, which compiles and presents crime statistics, they're showing that in Michigan in particular, for every 100,000 inhabitants, you would likely have 7.6 homicides. So obviously, if you're only talking about 3,000 inhabitants, that's what I mean. Like This is likely something that only happens a few times a decade in an area of that size. Hansen couldn't comment about Ricky Bailey's case due to it being an open and active investigation. However, Hansen did say the past residents of Ricky Bailey's home had drug issues. Although her mother and father divorced, Amanda Bailey said her family has always been super close and tight-knit. I probably talked to my dad six or seven, almost 10 times a day. I mean, my dad was literally my best friend, she said. Bailey said her father was a good man who enjoyed restoring old cars. He worked on 30 plus project cars. His children meant everything to him, she said. He loved his kids. When I mean he loved his kids, he adored his kids. And not just his kids, but kids in general. His love for his granddaughter, Amanda's daughter, shined brightly. She said it's been difficult adjusting to her new life. And it's been especially hard for her brothers who were present during the killing. I can't imagine what those two are going through. Just knowing that they were in the house. I mean, how do you even sleep comfortably at night after going through an event like that? I don't know. I truly hope that they're both getting some form of of emotional support, counseling, some type of help with something like that. Um, Cause that's, that's, that's a life's journey at this point, dealing with that moving forward. There's a lot more to this than having him go naturally. Amanda said, I didn't get to say goodbye to my dad. She also said that they're petrified because they have no idea who did this or why, but through her grieving and constant updates with the police, she thinks about the day when officials finally catch who did this to her father. I sit here almost every night and hope to catch these guys, she said. I hope to actually have myself sit face to face to them and tell them what they did to my family. I hope so too. And in a case like this, I'm thinking the best shot at that is knowing that they interacted with him directly, that there was this attack outside of the shooting. I'm hoping there was some type of DNA transfer, something along those lines. If he just grabbed them, was able to scratch them, get some of their skin off under his nails. Uh, if, if there was enough of a struggle, I mean, who knows? Maybe they left blood on the scene. Did they touch anything? Um, I'm just really hoping that on the forensic front, there was some discovery made. Maybe it's taking a while to process it and analyze it and test it. Uh, I just really hope there's something like that because this is just such a tough case, the way it's coming out through the media, at, at least the way it's being presented to us right now. So while that's all of the articles that are kind of directly related to the case, there is one other article that mentions it in an interesting way even though it kind of discounts the possibility of it being connected, I went looking into more details about this and I'm not exactly convinced that it's 100% ruled out. So let's just take a look at this possibility real quick over at abc12.com. Arrest warrant issued for third member of hate group with ties to Huron County. Another person is facing charges in connection with a break-in at a Huron County residence involving members of the base. Federal authorities say Justin Watkins is a self-proclaimed leader of the white supremacist group with violent inclinations. Watkins is accused of running a hate camp from a house outside of Bad Axe. And if you're wondering, is it in the same direction? Yes, this house is very, very close. Investigators believe it is a paramilitary organization which has proclaimed war against minority communities. Neighbors are still concerned because about a half mile from the former suspected base house is the home where 59-year-old Ricky Bailey was shot and killed by two masked intruders. There have been no arrests in that case, which investigators believe is not linked to the base. Why do they believe it's not linked to the base? 
I went looking into several other articles about this organization. From what I can tell, it's a group of young men. I think it's four of them that got together. One of them decided he wanted to live in some property that his dad owned out there. Uh, he asked, I, I believe it's his stepmother to go move out there with him. And then as they're living there, he decides that he's going to start this organization. The base, I guess, is the literal translation for Al Qaeda. Uh, so he gets this thing going. He invites some of these other guys to come live with him. They're apparently training out in this. They, I think it's a three acre lot, if I remember right. And really the only thing that I see them do is they show up to a Black Lives Matters march and they're kind of dressed up. I don't know what they're supposed to be representing here, some type of enforcers of some kind, but you can see that members of the public not necessarily digging their vibes. And of course, the sheriffs uh, keeping very strict tabs on them there. From what I see after that event, things like start unraveling within this group, but they've also now caught the attention of local authorities and we have all these new laws that are coming into place all over this country about like it, it's illegal to train for acts of terrorism. And effectively, you have these guys kind of saying, hey, we're yeah, we've got this base camp and that's where we train for these things. They start harassing a local family. Uh, they start breaking into empty buildings that are owned by the government. So. They throw everything they got at these guys. They charge them left and right. Now, I think part of the reason why the sheriff's department thinks they're likely not involved in this case is because two of them actually get arrested. But there's something else that happens around here. That stepmother, who I think is kind of paying the bills and kind of keeping the place up, she decides she's going to bail because all these friends that have moved in were supposed to help contribute, pay some form of rent, and they don't. So she splits. So you effectively have four young guys. I don't even think all of them are 18. I think one of them was actually 17 at the time uh, living in this place. How long is that sustainable? I have no idea. Is it a thought that maybe one of them would need money? Absolutely. So she jumps out in September. In October, I know two of them get arrested. The other two eventually get arrested, but I can't find a time frame for when. And I'm just wondering, were those other two still staying at the house through December? Is there some possibility that those could be the other two? Why do I find it so compelling is really because of something we touched on before and the location of where their home is. Let's go ahead and bring up the map real quick. So we're looking at Ricky's home on Rapson Road. Where's the base camp? right here. It's half a mile from Ricky's home. And just taking a look at this area, there's, there's really no other homes. There's one other homestead here right on the same street. And then the next house over is where Ricky lives. I mean, is it possible to think that you've got these guys that are doing this paramilitary training exercise stuff out in this area and half a mile away, you have something that sounds like it, it, it's a, it's a brutal home invasion. That sounds like it is an, a plan that's being executed. It's, it's just too similar unless, you know, unless sheriffs have verified, no, we had all four of them arrested at that point. We know where all of them were. None of them were out on bail or anything like that. We had them all in our custody, unless they have that condition, I don't know how you necessarily rule this out. And keep in mind that one point that I was stuck on earlier in this video, why would the first thing that the 11 year old have heard is the door opening? I mean, how many of you, the first thing I hear in my house is I hear a car pulling up the driveway. Why wouldn't there have been that noise? Why wouldn't you have heard it? Were these guys on foot? This is only half a mile. I mean, if, if they're running, they could easily do that in five minutes or less and be gone. No vehicle coming, no vehicle going. Seems to fit a lot of the conditions that we're hearing about, at least with the publicly released information on this case. So I don't know. That's where I kind of get stuck with that one. I can't completely rule it out. 
I just can't verify that all four of them were actually in custody at this time. And they were trying to grow an organization. There's a chance that there's more that maybe we don't know or haven't identified. But what we're left with is a family now missing a father and a young woman that is asking for help. My dad, Ricky Bailey, was shot and killed in his home on December 30th, 2020 in Bad Axe. The two men that are out there walking free, we'd like justice, we'd like closure. If anybody has any information on who may have done this, please contact the Huron County Sheriff's tip line. Their number is 989-269-2861. This family deserves answers. They do deserve justice and closure. If you have information on this case, we've got all the contact details you need in the description box down below. And remember, as of right now, there's a $4,100 reward that is part of that. If you don't have the answers, but you have friends in Michigan, please share this video with them. Let's help raise exposure and try to give this family every chance we can at finding justice. Before I sign off here today, I just want to thank some people that help keep us here on YouTube. Obviously, we do not run commercials in the middle of these presentations. There might be one at the start, there might be one at the end, and that's it. We can't do that without the support of many amazing people out there. A big thank you to new patrons, Wendy Belton and Aaron Morganroth. If you'd like to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Aisha recently did. We appreciate each and every one of you that keeps us here trying to help these families that very desperately need it. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you again here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel. <laughs>